Hi, my name is Veronica Miranda, and I am a helper in the children's ministry in the New Life Patterson. I'd like to invite you to join us in worshiping the Lord and praising Him this weekend. So please join us on our online service this week. For more information, see the information below. There is a sound I love to hear It's the sound of the Savior's robe As he walks into the room Where people pray Where we hear praises He hears faith The sound I love to hear It's the sound of the Savior's robe As he walks into the room Where people pray Where we hear worship He hears faith so thankful that you have decided to join us for our online worship experience. Just a reminder before we jump into the message today that you'll find all the information that you need, sermon notes and other resources in the text below. So be sure you check that out. If you have your Bible today, I encourage you to turn with me to John chapter 5. John is the fourth book in the New Testament. 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John does an excellent job of telling us who Jesus is, how much he loved us, and what exactly he did for us because of that love. So we're going to be in John chapter 5, and we're going to start in verse 1, and we're going to go all the way through verse 7 for right now. And then we'll explore a little bit more a little later. So here we go, John chapter 5, verse 1, it says this. Afterwards, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish Jewish holy days. Inside the city, near the Sheep Gate, was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew that he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, Would you like to get well? I can't, sir, verse 7 says. The sick man responded. I can't, sir. We are in the middle of a summer series called Questions. It's an opportunity for us to look at some of these bold, odd, strange, profound questions that we read in the Bible. And it gives us an opportunity to unpack them a little bit, to kind of chew on them, and to see if there's lessons there that we can apply to our day-to-day walk with God. Here in John, uh, John tells us about a group of people who obviously believed that if they hung around this pool long enough and if they were lucky enough, that they might receive a healing to whatever was ailing them. Now, the story goes something like this. When the water stirred, some translations say when the waters bubbled, an all-out race would take place. For the people who were gathered there, remember, everybody who was there needed some kind of healing. When the waters bubbled, an all-out race would take place, and the the first one in the water received the healing. At least, that's what they believed. Now, some might call this superstition. Maybe it was uh, folklore or a wives' tale or whatever. And maybe it was something a little darker than that. Maybe it was steeped in idolatry. The origin of the belief is unclear. But one thing that is very apparent is the fact that a lot of individuals gathered there. A lot of them. And this one in particular man had been there for 38 years. John tells us about this man who is having a hard time being one of the first ones into the pool. Maybe he has a disease. Maybe he's paralyzed. There is some reason why he can't be first. And regardless, this pool has become this man's new identity. 38 years. Let that sink in for a second. 38 years of making his way to the pool each and every day. I have so many questions. I don't know how independent this man was. Obviously, he was having a hard time getting to the pool. So I don't know if it was just that he was slower than everybody else. I don't know if he was just dependent on other people to get him in there. I don't know exactly what was wrong, but I do know this. Day in and day out, he showed up at the pool. Did he have to be carried to the pool? I don't know. Did he bring food? Was he, was he able to leave and go get food? I don't know. Was he dependent on other people to share their food with him or to give him a handout? Did he ever go home at night or was he just living there? Had the pool become his home? There's so many ramifications that go into 38 years of sitting by this pool. It absolutely blows my mind. On this in particular day, Jesus walks among the people of the pool and I can imagine that folks were just scattered on the pool deck. They had their belongings, they were sitting on their mats, there was baskets of clothes and food and different things that they needed. As Jesus moves through the crowd, he sees the blind, he sees the sick, he sees the lame. You have to understand a community has formed there. These people that needed these healings, these people that were hopeless, they gathered there day after day. Most of the faces in the pool were not strangers, at least to those who were sitting there, but Jesus, he was a stranger. People were so lost in their ailment that they had exchanged hope for luck. And as Jesus walks through the crowd, he sees what the naked eye cannot see. He sees past the sickness and past the disease, and he sees what's on the inside. He sees the heart. He sees the mind, the thoughts, and he sees how lost these individuals really are. I wonder if Jesus' mood was somber. 
I wonder if he, his heart was heavy. I imagine that this environment saddened him. Now, for whatever reason, Jesus saw something in the man that was sitting there for 38 years. He saw something inside this man, his thought, his mind, something. He saw something that caused him to stop. And Jesus asked the strange question, would you like to get well? Let's read it again. This time we're going to start John chapter 5, verse 5, and we're going to go on from there. So John chapter 5, verse 5, one of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years when Jesus saw him and knew that he had been ill for a long time. He asked him, would you like to get well? Verse 7 says, I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Verse 8, Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking powerful stuff. But when I read this, there's some obvious questions that I have. The first question is this, why in the world would Jesus ask that question? I mean, that just seems like a no-brainer. That's the kind of question that when you hear that, you go, huh? Like, wait, why would you ask a man who has been sick for 38 years if he wanted to get well? That just doesn't make any sense to me. So we need to dive deeper into why. And the second question that I have is, why didn't the man just respond with an absolute yes? Like, would you like to get well? Yes. Would you like to be healed? Absolutely. But our man didn't do that. Our friend didn't answer with a yes. So we have to dive into that a little bit. What a crazy question to ask a man for 38 years struggling, do you want to get well? Now see, there's a reason though, and we need to remind ourselves that Jesus doesn't ask random questions. Jesus isn't asking a question because he lacks information. Jesus is very intentional about his question. His question is designed to get the mindset right, to get this man from point A to point B so that Jesus can do something in his life. So we're gonna chew on that. This question is intentional. Why would Jesus ask it? If you're taking notes this morning, write this down for point number one. Jesus exposes the true cost of my desires. Maybe he asked the question because he needed to expose the true cost of the man's desires. I believe that when Jesus looked into this man's mind, he saw something that concerned him. Maybe the man had developed an unhealthy comfortableness with his ailment. Now, before I go any further, I want to address something very real, very personal. I, 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 need, I need to explain myself here for just a second. I am in no way undermining or reducing the seriousness of what you might be li living with or dealing with at this moment. I am in no way telling you that you have become way too comfortable with your circumstances. I am very, very sensitive to the fact that some of you are struggling with some very real, some very debilitating issues, whether it be emotionally, spiritually, or physically. And I want you to understand that I am not going to offend you by assuming that I know what you need to do to fix it. I am painting with very broad strokes today. I am speaking from this 10,000 foot view because I do know this. As human beings, there are times that we become comfortable with our environment. So what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna ask you to extend me a little bit of grace because let me, let me say it again so you hear it. I don't know you, I don't know your story, I don't know your situation. Okay, so as humans, Human nature tells me that we sometimes develop this unhealthy comfortableness to our circumstances and our environment. And I think that this is something that happens to all of us. I'll go as far as to say this. I believe that we become a product of our environment. There's, there's this thing that we do, we adapt, and the fact that we adapt can be a really positive thing, and it can also be a really, really negative thing. See, in my mind, I believe that there's a difference between being comfortable and being content. I believe being comfortable might be unhealthy, and being content might be a really, really good thing. And I think that those two things, they look completely different. 
Being content is a mindset that we develop that says, despite my circumstances, despite my environment, d- despite my, my, my disability, my whatever the case may be, despite this, I'm going to be content in the fact that everything I need comes from God. That God's going to give me all that I need, despite the obstacles that I'm up against. I'm going to be content in him. Why? Because his grace, his love, his, his substance, his, his providence, Fighting for me is, is everything that I need. I'm still going to live my best life. I'm still going to be content in him. And I believe that that is something that, that God is wanting. Now there's this other side of the coin, this comfortableness that says, I really, really would like to, but you don't understand. I'm, I'm, I've got this thing and so I can't. And we get comfortable sometimes in the I can't. Why? Because we're human beings. I think that this is exactly what God was trying to teach the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12. Three times Paul asked to remove a thorn, an ailment, that he was struggling with. Three times he said to God, will you please take this away? And three times the Lord responded with no. I'm not going to take it away from you. I'm not going to heal you of that. You're going to have to learn to be content. In fact, what he said to him is he said, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. I will give you everything that you need to learn how to live your best life and to put your identity in me despite this ailment, despite this obstacle in your life. Maybe our friend at the pool tech and the pool deck had become a little too comfortable And I think Jesus asked the question to make our friend realize that there was a price to be paid if he received the healing that he was looking for. And this is what I mean by that. I I don't want you to get caught up in in the fact that I just said there's a price to be paid because in no way, shape, or form am I saying that you scratch his back and he'll scratch your back. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that you uh, give more in the offering plate and you'll receive that healing. You read more, you pray more, you go tell more people about Jesus and you'll receive that healing that you're looking for. I, that's not the price that I am talking about in any way, shape, or form. But I, I think that I can best explain what I'm asking or what I'm saying with this, with this statement. What if Jesus would have asked the man the question in a different way? This is the price I'm talking about. What if he would have said, are you ready to leave all your dependencies and to be able to start living your best life? If he would have worded it that way, we would have known exactly what he was asking. What if he would have said, are you ready to take on the full responsibility of life? What if he would have said, instead of, do you want to get well, what if he would have said, are you ready to leave this identity and to adopt the identity that I have for you. See, there's a price that comes with our healing. Church, the truth of the matter is this. Many of our desperate prayers to God have a price in their answer. And I think that that's why Jesus asked the question because of the fact that he needed the man to understand, if I give you what you're asking for, it's going to change everything about your life. Are you willing for everything to change? That's what he was asking. In my copy of the Bible, I I read out of the New Living Translation, and there's different translations of the Bible. They all say the same thing, but they use different words. And I love the way the King James Version reads when you read John 5, 6. See, in my Bible, the question that Jesus asked reads like this, do you want to get well? But in the King James Version, and I want to share it with you, it says this. Verse 6, chapter 5, verse 6 of John, King James. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been there now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, wilt thou be made whole? (laughs) That is a powerful question. Will thou be made whole? And the price to be paid is, are you willing to do whatever needs to happen to be made whole? And that's a question that Jesus was asking to our friend. And that's a question that I believe that we can be asking ourselves today. Write this down for point number two. Maybe Jesus asked the question because Jesus desires my focus to be shifted. Jesus desires my focus 
to be shifted. I believe it's very possible that Jesus asked this crazy question to get our friend's eyes off of his problem and off of his answer and his environment and to refocus his eyes, his ears, his, his attention completely and solely on Jesus and Jesus alone. Maybe Jesus asked that question to kind of shake him up and to say, hey, focus, pay attention, listen to what I'm saying to you. As human beings, sometimes it's easy for us to lose focus, isn't it? <laughs> for me, I have a big problem with losing focus, uh, and, and, and this is what happens. I'm not proud of this, but this is the truth. Uh, a storm will blow into my life, a situation comes into my life, a problem comes into my life, and I immediately don't go to God first. I see a problem, and I try to fix a problem. That's just the way I'm wired, and, and that is not a good thing. You would think that as a pastor, I would see a problem, a storm, a situation in my life, and I would immediately retreat. I would go to God. I would ask God, hey, I've got this problem. What do you want me to do? I wish I could tell you today that I do that. I don't do that. I immediately find my own answer, my own solution to the problem. And I do that with small stuff. And unfortunately, I do that with the big things as well. I'm not sure why I haven't learned my lesson because nine times out of 10, it does not turn out very well for me. Now, a few months ago, I had an issue with my automatic pool cleaner. This is just to illustrate what I'm talking about. I had, a, I had a problem with my automatic pool cleaner. You know that the creepy crawler thing that goes around the bottom of the pool and it sucks up dirt? Well, the stupid thing was not sucking up dirt like it was supposed to, and it was driving me crazy. Now, there's two things about me that make this story make sense. Number one is this. I am not a fixer. I do not know how to fix things. I can't see something that's broken and go, oh, I have to do A, B, and C, and I will get it fixed. Like, that is not me in any way, shape, or form. Don't get me wrong. I own tools. I have tools, and, and the ironic thing is that at one time I got paid to fix things. That's, that's what's crazy. But I was always being told what to do and how to do it, right? My mind doesn't work where I just see a problem and automatically come up with the answer for it. Now, the second thing that you need to know is this. When something is broken, it absolutely drives me nuts, and I fixate on it, and I'm consumed by it, and it's all I can think of, and it uses, usually causes me to be an absolute bear, and I hate that about myself. So, a few months back, my creepy crawler, my pool thing, it's not working, and uh, and it's bothering me because my, it should be working and I don't know what's wrong with it and, and I ignore it for a couple of days hoping that it will fix itself. I do that too. It's just like I bury my head in the sand and just pray the problem goes away. It was evident two or three days into it. The problem was not going away. The pool was starting to get green. The algae was starting to grow. And I was like, okay, I got to go fix this thing. So I go outside with my handy dandy toolbox and I immediately come up with the answer to the problem. The answer to the problem was that my creepy crawler, my pool cleaner, obviously there's plastic things, there's gears, there's doohickey things that move in there. And I was like, those are obviously worn out. So I need to rip it apart, I need to order new stuff, and that's exactly what I did. I, I got my tools out, I watched a YouTube video, I ripped my pool cleaner apart. Yes, it had plastic doohickey things in there. And I got online, Amazon, I ordered more doohickeys, I put it all back together, I buttoned it up, I went over to the equipment pad, I hit start, and it didn't work. So, answer number two, Brian's answer number two. So answer number two was, if it's not my pool cleaner, it's got to be the pump, right? And so I go back to the drawing board. I start watching YouTube videos on how to fix my pump. My pump's not sucking like it should. Try this, try that. I rip my pump apart, right? I got my pump in multiple different pieces. In the process of doing that, I destroy gaskets and seals and all those things that you need to make a pump work, Right? I don't know what I'm doing. And when I tear into something, I usually make it 10 times more expensive and harder than it really needs to be. So I jump on Amazon. I order some new stuff. It comes a day or so later. I put it all back together. I go to the equipment pad. I hit start. Nothing. I didn't skip a beat. <laughs> 
I came up with solution number three. Well, I even kind of laughed at myself. It is obvious, don't even know why I didn't think about this earlier. It is totally obvious that I have a clog in the underground piping that goes from the side of my pool to the pump itself. I can't see the pipe. I have no clue if there's really a clog in there, but I'm 100% convinced that I now have the answer. I jump back on Amazon and I order a long snake that I can attach to a drill, and I spend money on that. I also also bought this, like people who bought this also kind of bought this thing. So I bought one of those too. I didn't even know what it did, but I bought it. I wait a couple of days, the parts show up. I'm ripping into my pool equipment. I'm trying to roto-rooter the pipes out. I'm sweating, I'm angry, I'm mad at the world. I get it all done, I think it's all finished. I go over, I hit start. Nothing. And guys, let me just tell you, I absolutely lose my ever-loving mind. I was so frustrated that I actually screamed out loud. My neighbors heard me, I'm sure of it. I quit. I'm done with this stupid thing. I have no idea what I'm doing. And I go back over to my porch and I just throw a temper tantrum and I just sit down. My poor wife and kids are like, do not go outside. I sit there for about 10 minutes or so, and I'm not thinking anything, I'm not saying anything, I'm just staring at my stupid green water and my stupid pool cleaner. And in that spirit of surrender and giving up, I just felt this voice. I didn't hear anything, it wasn't audible. I just had this feeling and this thought comes to my mind and the thought was this, it's in the hose. The pool cleaner floats around on the bottom of the pool. The very first line in this chain of things is this flexible blue hose that goes from the pool cleaner to the side wall. That's the first thing that dirt and gunk and stuff goes through, right? It passes through the pool cleaner, it goes into the hose. And as I'm sitting there throwing this temper tantrum, something inside of me tells me it's in the hose. I actually say out loud, God, it cannot be in the hose. Right, Because if it's in the hose, what that means is that I've spent a whole lot of time, I've spent a whole lot of money, I was an absolute bear to my wife and kids, I was not sleeping well for the last few nights, I was miserable at work, I was absolutely consumed with something that is seriously a 10 second fix. I got up, I, I, I fished the pool cleaner out of the bottom of the pool, I popped the hose off the pool cleaner, I looked inside and sure enough there's a piece of bark that is completely turned sideways. It's right there, two inches inside of the, of, of the hose. I had needle nose pliers in my pocket. I squeeze it, pull it out, put it back together, throw it into the deep end, hit start, and the darn thing takes off. Now, I am not telling you that the Holy Spirit told me that my problem was in the hose. I'm not telling you that. But I'm also not telling you that the Holy Spirit (laughs) told me that it was in the hose. I don't know if it was the Holy Spirit or if it was the fact that I just got out of my way, but here's the situation. It wasn't until I surrendered, it wasn't until I stopped coming up with my own answers that the answer was actually revealed to me. It wasn't until I got out of my own way and stopped trying to fix my problem on my own that the answer was right in front of me. Our friend who sat on the pool deck for 38 years, he knew what the problem was. He had a disability. He also knew what the ramification of that problem was and the fact that it was causing him to not live his best life. His whole identity was in that pool. He also had his answer to his problem. And his answer to his problem was, I have to be first in the pool, and today might be the day, and he told himself that for 38 years. You know what, at some point in this process, it had to have been maddening, where he went and he had hope, and he went and he had hope, and he thought today might be the day, and today might be when my answer to my problem becomes a reality, and there had to have been a point along that whole journey where he just gave up, and he was like, I quit. I'm broken, I'm defeated. I've completely surrendered. Maybe that's why when Jesus asked him, do you want to get well? He immediately said in verse 7, I can't. I can't get well. 
Jesus came, asked him the question. And when he asked him the question, it took his eyes off of his problem and onto Jesus. Will thou be made whole? Let's go back to our text because I want to focus on seven and eight really quick. So, Starting in verse 6, when Jesus saw that he had knew and he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? Verse 7, I can't, sir, the man said, for I have no one to put me in the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Verse 8, Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat and walk. Verse 9, instantly the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. Verse 7 Jesus says, do you want to be made whole? And the man immediately goes into the same story he's been telling everyone for 38 years. The same story that at some point in this 38-year journey, this man had gotten comfortable with and resolved, this is my lot in life. He had it played out from start to finish. Well, see, stranger, you have to understand that I can't because of A, B, C, and D. And I love verse 8 because the way I read it, and I'm not saying this is accurate, I'm not saying it's biblical, But when I read this account, verse 8 is where Jesus actually kind of steps on this guy's conversation and interrupts him. How it all played out, I'm not exactly sure, and I won't tell you that I know because I don't know. But in my mind, I like to think that the man was saying, well, let me explain to you why I can't. I can't because of A, B, C, and D. And I I just see Jesus stepping in on that and going, hey, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. And you know what's even more powerful to me is, is I like to replace that word walk with the, with, I like, I, in my mind Jesus goes, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. Go back to the life that you should be living. Go back to the life that I have for you. Leave all of this behind. Stand up, pick up your mat and go home. In closing, I want to take one last look at our friend here. And I don't want to talk about his problem because we all know his problem was very, very real. It's obviously that he had an extreme handicap that was hindering him. I also don't want to talk anymore about the fact that he had his own answer to his own problem. You get that. Heck, I'm admitting that if I was in his shoes, I probably would have had my own answers to, to my own problem. This man didn't know who Jesus was. It's, it's evident if you keep reading in John chapter 5 because in just a few more verses, somebody's going to ask him, who was it that healed you? And he goes, I don't know. He had no idea this was Jesus. He had no idea of his healing power. I don't, I don't want to focus on the fact that he came up with his own answers uh, and then he told the Messiah, no, I can't be healed. I, I, and I, because he didn't know he was talking to the Messiah. I, I sympathize with this guy because I would have done the exact same thing. What I want to focus on is this. I want to talk about the man's response to Jesus. Jesus interrupts him in my mind in verse 8 and says, Stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. And what blows me away is that he did it. (laughs) He did it. He didn't say, but, or, yeah, right, or, I'd like to, but I can't. No, he didn't. Jesus said, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Think about this. There had to be something so powerful, so convicting, about the way Jesus looked, about what was in his eyes, about his demeanor, whatever, that when this man started telling a story and Jesus stepped on it and said, listen, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home, this man didn't hesitate. He just obeyed. And he obeyed a complete stranger. That, to me, is powerful, and it's life-changing. And I say to myself, dear God, Please let me respond. His obedience to stand was completely undoing the last 38 years. Our friend taught us all a lesson in what it's like to be obedient. I want to go back to the scripture, John chapter 5, and this time I want to read verses 9 to 11. Instantly the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. But this miracle happened on the Sabbath. So the Jewish leaders objected and they said to the man who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry your sleeping mat. Verse 11, but he replied, the man who healed me 
told me, pick up your mat and walk. You know why I love, I love that so much? It's because when Jesus said, stand up, pick up your mat, go home, he was actually breathing life into this man. He was starting chapter two of this man's life. He was giving him a fresh start. He was saying, this is no longer your identity. Pick up, get your mat, get your stuff, and walk out of here. And the man was obedient, and the man did it. And as soon as he was walking away, life started throwing other problems at him. And the uppity-ups, the religious leaders, the people who looked down on everybody because they thought they were better than everybody else, they start throwing threats at this guy. Hey, 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 partner. What do you think you're doing? Well, don't you know it's the Sabbath? Don't you know there's a law? Hey, you are breaking the law right now by carrying that mat. Who told you to do that? And I love his response in verse 11. He says, the man who healed me told me to do it. And I'm ad-libbing, but I can just imagine him going, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to carry the mat. I don't care if it's against the law. That guy changed my life and he told me to stand up and go and I'm gonna do it. Man, I wanna live a life like that. I'm gonna end this sermon with two questions. <laughs> and it's a sermon on questions. But I'm gonna end it with two questions. My questions are this, do you want to get well? And before you answer that, remember that there is a price that comes with that. He's going to ask something of you. There's also a 100% focus because whatever Jesus is going to do next requires you to keep your eyes on him. Do you want to get well? How about this, will thou be made whole? That's powerful. And the second question I want to leave you is this. If Jesus asks you to stand, are you willing to choose the obedience? Are you willing to let everything that your life is wrapped up in go just to be obedient? Only you can answer those questions. My hope, my prayer is that you'll have time to be able to reflect, to do a little self-check, and maybe have a conversation with God. Would you like to get well? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the lessons that we can learn from the man at the pool. Father, help me apply those lessons to my own life. Help us get out of our own way. Lean not on our own understanding. But instead, Lord, acknowledge you first and always. Help us to refocus those areas in our life that need adjusting. Help us to have the wisdom to know the areas that need to be tweaked. Lord, we love you. We need you. And Father, we ask that you will continue to work in and through our lives. Father, we love you. We ask these things in your holy and precious son's name. Amen. Church, I hope and pray you have a fantastic rest of the week. I pray blessings on you and your family. And I hope you come back and join us again next Sunday. Take care.